Good noon, everyone. I'm Ellen O'Shaughnessy, coordinator of this Conversations and Coffee program. Delighted to have you during this busy time celebrating the art of Susan Schubert, who is truly improvisational. If you walk through her exhibit, right next door in our loft gallery, you are surrounded by the beauty of pastel, glass, collage, the theme of the wild things, the theme of the wild ocean. Susan was telling me she's very excited that her work was accepted by the Columbus Museum of Art for a show, a jury show, Evening with Art. And her, she is doing collages entitled Chaos. Ah. <laughs> Sounds challenging there, Susan. <laughs> Did you have a good Very time? Very timely. Did I had you a wonderful have a good time, time celebrating chaos? Wonderful. <laughs> uh, uh, Susan studied art uh, early in her life, but then didn't pick it up again until she came here to the Cultural Arts Center and has taken classes for three and a half years. Her life was spent as a professional trainer and speaker. And that is truly uh, a gift. And as we mentioned earlier, she is an improvisational artist out of New York. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and as you uh, improvise, you must be walking around thinking yeah. creating yeah. all the time. That's and, true. And How did I, you get that? Well, I, I remember your book, which I loved. There is a human in my bed, as you created this wonderful story oh, yeah, of good. animals, uh, our doggies, uh, just the aliveness of it that you, you brought. Thank you. That's so, so sweet. Well, it's, it's, it's so true. And you know, I... Uh, took students to the Improvisational Theater in Chicago. And it was part of uh, something that we were doing on a retreat. And those improvisational artists talked about how they are continually creating. And not something that's necessarily expected, mm -hmm. but something mm -hmm. that comes out of all the creative parts. Of you got me. You're the first person who really gets me. <laughs> you really, really get me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm honored. Well, maybe besides my husband. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, as you are going to share with us the art of food for the holidays, integrating food right. with the beauty of your painting, your collages. Yes. All right. Well, take over. All We're right. Delighted to have you with us. Thank you, this Susan is Schubert. Such a challenging subject, and as always, the best place to go is to the internet. And what I'm going to do is a quick overview of food and art. This is art history in about two minutes, uh, maybe a little bit more. And then it's how to create your food art for the holidays, how to do something that's spectacular, that your family, friends, and guests will not expect, but that also integrates your artistic skills in creating something beautiful. And the third part of it is to eat the art. So I asked some of the instructors here about why so many people use fruit as a theme for their art. And here are a couple of the answers. One is it doesn't move around. So, you know, you don't have to pay for a model. Two is if you can do a luscious peach, you can do a luscious person. So it teaches you the forms and the shapes and the colors. And one of the instructors said, you know, you go from a peach to skin tones, and it's not such a big distance. And what else did I want to think about? I can't figure out, and maybe you'll have an answer, 
how did these spectacular artists paint these wonderful paintings of fruit? And you know, this is not plastic fruit. This is not glass fruit. This is real food that decays. So I haven't decided, you know, either they had photographic memories or they kept replacing the fruit. One or the other or both, I don't know. So a little bit about the history of art over the millennia. Art in food goes back to 3,500-year-old Egyptian art. Now, if you study that art for just a moment, as I did, I was trying to figure out what this is all about. What are we looking at? Maybe eggs, fish, fowl, perhaps wine, maybe buckets of food. And all of a sudden, it struck me that the early art, something we call art today, may have actually been things for counting. It might have been things that were used for business interactions. That was what was found in the first cuneiforms. I don't know if I pronounced that right. So in any case, food is so much of the cornerstone of our existence that you almost can't avoid it. It's everywhere. And I used to, the, uh, I'm sorry, I wanted to make the, uh, give you the reference, Food in the Arts, a look at artistic use of food over the millennia. That was one of my references. And the second reference is the book, A Thousand and One Paintings You Must See Before You Die. Has anyone seen those series? They're absolutely wonderful. It gives you the best art in the entire world from the beginning to today. Uh, so I went back, all the way back, to 1495 to 1498. Now, who doesn't know what this is? Of course you know what it is. I wish I had a pointer because I would show you that the fruit. There's a pointer on there. If you press that red button. The red button. Oh, how cool. It was just there a minute ago. Where? Where is it? Okay. Well, anyway, <laughs> you know that you know about the religious symbology in the in Leonardo's painting. Everything has to do with threes and triangles. The food on the table is the base of the triangle, so that was intentionally done as religious symbols. And uh, the, the uh, Trinity, the God, the Father, and the Holy Son, you'll see showing up in many, many paintings and art from that period. Here's another one that, again, shows images right out of the Bible. This is from 1472 to 1553. I don't know if there was a date. The Fall of Man by Lucas Cranach. And this is, once again, the fruit on the Tree of Knowledge. And, you know, they started doing fruit. So when you're doing a fruit bowl, you might be thinking about fruit from the Garden of Eden. Just a thought, just a thought. And we're moving up. We're moving up slowly, 1573, Giuseppe Archimbaldo. Did I get this right, uh, Jeff? Archimbaldo? Sure. All right, whatever it is, it's good. <laughs> he did something so imaginative in 1573. He used fruit, he painted fruit, to look like pieces of the face of the figures. Down below you can see wheat and up above you can see the fruits and the faces. He was not particularly popular at his, in his time, but I think today we would say he's avant-garde, right? He went out of favor for a while. Look it up, you know, his art is just wonderful. Um, let's see, he painted in the imaginative style of the mannerist art. So speaking of, what did you call me? Innovative, imaginative? He was way improvisational. improvisational. He was way, way ahead. And this one, I love it, 1593. Marisa de Car Caravaggio, Basket of Fruit by Michelangelo de Caravaggio. The fruit is luscious. Here's more symbols. This is no longer symbols of religion. Now we're getting symbols of, come and get me. I am sensual. I am luscious. It's not just the fruit, it's the figure up there. 
So this was behind the scenes. You really have to do a little bit of reading in our history to know the meaning of this stuff. Voluptuous is the word. I like that, voluptuous. And, th whoops, went a little too fast. This one I fell in love with. And you'll see it coming back to you later on. This is from 1633, Still Life with Lemons by Francisco de Zuberon. He is from Spain. And everything about his work is just about warmth and oh, the sweetness, delectability of the fruit. What's in there is a symmetrical arrangement. Everything is right up along the edge of the table. And this might be a good time to unveil what I have done for the holidays. OK. So I am going to challenge all of you to create something based on a real work of art, based on a real fruit arrangement, or some kind of setup with flowers and fruit. And I'm going to do some things with this. Let me go through the rest of this, and then I'm going to come back and modify it a little bit. 1894, Cezanne, double perspective, unbalanced parts. You'll see that this is very balanced, right? This is very even, very symmetrical. Cezanne is starting to move into something that's more innovative again, more unbalanced, but he's still using the lemons and the oranges, and of course, he's added the vase and the drapery. Now we come up to 1972, Roy Lichtenstein. We take a right turn into art history, and what do we have with Roy Lichtenstein? Anybody know anything about him? He had that big airplane. Yeah. Fresh Strokes in Flight, yeah, that's at the Columbus Museum of Art right now in the Sculpture <coughs> Garden. His art was largely uh, imitative of printing processes. He identified with pop art. But once again, you see the same thing, a basket of fruit or a dish of fruit. Probably, it looks kind of like a silver, I don't know what you call it, a, a silver bowl that's holding the fruit, but we still have the same thing again. And now we have fruit that comes from all over the world. We have bananas, grapes, maybe apples, maybe lemons. But we're seeing things again that might not have come together in ancient art because where were the bananas in 1500? I don't think they had them, at least not where the artists were painting. I don't know, I'm gonna look up bananas that's my next research. Now, I had a real challenge to find something that was more current, 2016 to 17. You know, I, I did a little Google search on uh, still life in 2017, 2018, and I came up with a lot of really weird stuff. I came up with a lot of things that were cubistic and almost unrecognizable. Then I found something that was sort of recognizable. This is by Ruth Formica. Now, I've never heard of her, so I have no way of telling you whether she's famous or not. It just happens to be an example that works for what I'm talking about for, for the holidays. And she does improvisational paintings. And uh, she said, you have to read the space, not through colors, but by picking out the objects that are cre created by the lines. What do you see in this? What can you pick out? Yeah, maybe some grapes in the upper right quadrant. What else do we see? Pear. Pardon me? A pear. Where do you see the pear? It's to the left of the grapes, a white outline that looks like a pear. Oh, you have really an eyesight. There you go. What else do we have? This is a plum or an apple or something like that, right? And here, perhaps there's the banana returning. What would you say? Could be. Could be. But the thing about this is it can be pretty much whatever you want it to be, right? Mm -hmm. 
Or it could not be fruit. Maybe it's, I don't know, could be something else. What do you think about the blue as the background against the, the roses of the fruit or whatever it is there? I kind of like it. The older painters tended not to, well, here we've got a light blue. Cezanne used a light blue. This is just a solid black. How do you like that solid black with the background of the fruit? I think it's really, really dynamic. It gives you a sense that the fruit is about to pop off the page and land right into your hands. Now Caravaggio's work is very, very, I'd say like a Renaissance painting with that real dark in the background again. And that figure is so luscious. Come and love me, come and love me. All right, so we went through the pop art up until more contemporary, and now I want to show you some things about this piece. We could turn this into a Christmas piece and or something for Hanukkah. Any ideas? I'm going to give you some ideas. First of all, this, how many lemons are here? Let's lose one and just have three lemons. What do we have now? Something that doesn't stay up. I know why it's in four, because otherwise it doesn't stay up. Three, remember, three in Christianity, right? We have the triangle, God the Father and the Holy Son, it becomes religious. Now, I'm not promulgating any religion here, I'm just giving you some of the symbology that might have been used, or symbolism, I don't think symbology is a word, but it sounds good to me. And we have here, a rose. What do you think this a rose might represent? Any ideas? Mary. Could be. Is that the representation for Mary? Is it a rose? Oh, I'm glad there's somebody here who knows that. All right, so we're going to keep the rose, right? All right, in here, in the painting, is a cup of water. But well, let's say, what if we change this to wine? And what if we put some wafers around here? Then what do we have? We might have communion. All right, now let's move this back a little bit. Oh, first of all, I didn't have any orange blossoms, I'm sorry. They're awfully hard to get in the middle of winter in Columbus, Ohio. So I don't know what these are, but these represent the orange blossoms. But let's imagine that we changed these to green holly or green from a tree, from a Christmas tree, and put it on the top here. All right, Hanukkah is also right about now. And Hanukkah, does anybody know how many candles we have for Hanukkah? Eight. Yeah. See, that's why they did four. I got it. I got it. All right, you win, Caravaggio. You win. I give up. So, let's see. We could do one, two, three, four. One, two, three. Anybody celebrate Hanukkah? Four. And we need one more in the middle, and now we have a little bit of a Hanukkah display. And I could add one more thing. The pomegranate also has some symbolism, uh, particularly in the Jewish faith, as it comes from Israel, I believe, I think. At least they grow there. And we could put this, where would you like me to put this? See if I could balance it on top of the oranges. Let's see if it works. Ah, yeah, it worked, it worked. And now we have something that has green and red in it. Green and red also has a meaning. I get a subscription to Artsy Magazine, and every day they send me stuff that's so current. I looked it up and said, why are red and green the colors of Christmas? Does anybody have any idea? 
You really have to be an art historian probably to know what this is. This came from a particular kind of artwork known as the rude screen. Anybody ever heard of a rude screen? Rude, R-O-O-D, not R-U-D-E, but R-O-O-D. And I'll pass this around, you can take a look at it. I just discovered this like this morning, so I didn't have quite have time to add it. And it divided the nave where the congregation gathered from the choir or chancel where the clergy sat. These were often painted in red and green. And where did the colors came from? They came from iron and copper. That's what made the colors. And it, during medieval times, these metals were associated with planets, Mars and Venus. All right? So that's how red and green came to be the colors for Christmas. And look at Ellen. She's perfect. There you go. Make sure you get a shot of Helen in there. For those of you who remember our name. All right. So it has meaning. It also means feminine and masculine. And what else do we have? For us, the red and green of Christmas is a Victorian invention. They suddenly discovered the rude screens. There aren't very many of them left. They're still in England. And Coke. I wish I had this. You remember what Coke did? They did the red, the red can and then the green little hollies on the, on the can. So they got right into what we now would call the spirit of Christmas. And it really is the spirit of Christianity. So that has meaning. No, I don't know enough about other faiths to be able to convert this into something else. If someone, I might look up Muslim, or Islam, I might look up some other faith, boot, faiths, Buddhism, but at the moment I don't have that knowledge up here in my brain. Now, a little bit of innovation. Oh yeah, I remember what I was going to do. I'm going to This might be nice. Every artist has to have scarfs, right? You have to do drapery. So I might suggest that you add some drapery around it. Now what does it look like? It looks beautiful, doesn't it? I, it looks a little bit Mexican. Yeah, I hope you're able to get a, a shot of this because I think it makes it look lovely. And a lot of artists do drapery. I have to come around for just a moment to see what it looks like. How about turning off the lights for a moment? Holly, could you turn off the lights? Let's get a real effect. A little more, a little more. Oh, that's, well, we can't turn that off. Never mind. All right, so these little things. Here's a plug. I found them online at Walmart for about $6 for something like 20 of them. These are very cool. They're little battery operated things. Don't they look nice? You know what else you could use if you don't want to use these little things? What else could you use? You might have a string of lights hanging around. Uh, you might have a string of lights that blink on and off. And if you have red and green ones, that would really make it for the holidays. Let's see what else I have on here. What did I do? I think that's the last one. Yep, that was the last one. All right. I want to show you a total change in direction. What this is, is part of a new series called Anxiety. And I paired fruit and food with, can anybody see what it is? Medicine bottles. And what else is in there is uh, something about doctors and prescriptions. So I'm showing about how people, this is an old, old man hiding out in here Would looking. It to pass that oh, I will, I will. I know. I'll just describe it and then I'll pass it around. Let me bring it up just a bit closer. So there's an old man up here, you know, he's holding on to his face and his face, I elongated the face. And there's another old man in here and I shattered him, just like people, especially older people, are shattered by what's going on in healthcare today and what's going on with insurance 
and you know everything else you know I don't have to tell you and then I show fruit in here as maybe there's some hope uh, maybe there's something good that you can do and have eat something that tastes wonderful and sweet eat it yourself and offer it to others back here of course in my prescription bottles doctors and I think I probably hit a prescription in here yeah I tore apart a prescription and just hit it within the painting folded it up at the bottom as well so this is part of my series on anxiety and someday when they're done I'll show them to you so why don't we start over here you're welcome to look you can touch I think I, I believe I've sprayed them with acrylic if not I will do it soon there's no glass on it just quite yet Thank you. Ah. Yeah, I mean, it just sort of grabs you by the heart and doesn't let go, right? I have another one in that series of a woman leaning over. It doesn't have anything to do with fruit. But she's leaning over like this with her head covered. And behind her, there's a man up above looking down like out of the murk. And then there's another man who's a soldier also looking down at her. And this one is fear. And where do you think that one came from? I'm just giving you a, a verbal description. Anybody have any thoughts? Bombings in Syria? Well, that's part of it. But there are two men in the background, remember? Soldier and there's a soldier. And there's another man looking at her. Harassment. Yeah. She's worrying. Has it, have any of you ever heard this? It's a very funny thing, and I can't remember where I first heard it. What do men worry about, and what do women worry about? Have you heard it? Yeah. Anybody heard it? I think, isn't it like men are afraid that women will laugh at them? Yes. And women are afraid that men will kill them? Yeah, I'll repeat it if you can't get it on the mic. Men are afraid that women will laugh at them or make fun of them, and women are afraid that men will kill them. And, you know, that's definitely what that piece is portraying and certainly a little bit about what's going on in the world right now. So coming back to our food art, I want to make sure that we have enough time to eat some of the food that's up here. What would you like to eat? You want to eat the oranges, the pomegranate? Hmm? What would you like? I am going to ask somebody besides me to cut it up. Would you care to cut it up? And then let me turn the tides a little bit. Is there anyone in here who uses fruit in their painting? Uses fruit or food, food or fruit in their painting? Well, when I started, in yeah, lessons, okay, uh, that was the challenge. Yes. Of, I can't. I can still feel what it was like to draw a pear. Yeah. Ah, oh, but then following Anita Miller's direction, uh, I could do it. And it was wonderful. And then uh, an apple. And you got better. I got better by thinking differently than right. thinking apple pear, as she directed. The, and when you said the experience of the fruit and then uh, drawing the human, that's what happened. Because the discipline of drawing the fruit and then the letting go made it possible to do a human right. face. Because if you're thinking about a human face rather than thinking about a face, you can think about what Giuseppe Archimbaldo did. He thought about a peach for a cheek. I don't know what this is. Squash, maybe? Oh, yeah, there it is. There's the rest of it. Squash. And I have a squash in the piece that's going around. And some cherries, maybe, and peas. Just totally imaginative. So the next time you're getting ready to do some art, yes? Because I don't paint, but um, I'm thinking since you mentioned that, I have a lot of photos of fruit and vegetables. Mm -hmm. A lot. Mm -hmm. It attracts you. Yeah. Why does it attract you? I don't know, the color mostly, I think, and the shapes. 
color. Yeah. I think the color, the color and the shapes, excuse me, the shapes are very central. And that's how you go from a peach and a pear to bosoms, you know, and a face and a shoulder. They all kind of connect as you're an artist. Anybody else use any live things to create their work? Why don't you come up here? Oh, we'll pass around the oranges. Yeah. Let's have a little conversation. I finished this a little quicker than I thought, so let's have some conversation here. There's a microphone here. Yeah. Into it? What do you think about this idea about putting together a still life for the holidays? How do you react to it? I'm just lucky to get the food on the table. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. He said, I'm just lucky to get the food on the table. <laughs> and you can arrange the food on the table in, in a way like this, or you could start early, because the, the fruit will last for at least a couple of weeks. So you could start, like right now, to do something that's interesting, if you want. What else? Any other thoughts about food art for the holidays? Terry, you're smiling. I'm sure you have an idea. I, I guess I think people are attracted to Oh, yeah. Could you take that I think people, the majority of people are probably, probably enticed by the fruit because of the taste and it's all round shapes, which to us are very comforting shapes. And it's not angular. Right. That is abrupt. It's soothing. And just it's, it's a wonderful color palette to use and you have a lot of complementary colors with your red and your green and so you can then dissect that and put it into other colors of that family so I, I just I love this Giuseppe painting I haven't seen one of those in a long time and um, brings back fond memories but um, I love this presentation, Susan, with the food art because I think that we need that brown, homey kind of atmosphere in our lives right now. So, thank you. Terry, that was a great observation. Yeah. You know, I also, as part of this research, I, I researched the history of the fruit bowl. You'd be astounded how far the fruit bowl goes back in history. You know, even in medieval times, they had plenty of food, especially in the country. And fruit was on the table all the time. It was part of their lives. And maybe this is something else that we could do. Not just glass fruit, but put out a fruit bowl with real fruit. It's a way of really inviting in our family and our friends to share food together. There's nothing better than sharing food together and um, I think, as Cherry mentioned, in this time, maybe that's a nice thing to do, is to share oranges, especially with the colds that are floating around right now. A big wallop of vitamin C, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Any other observations? I love to hear what you have to say. My thoughts are very different. That's good. Because, um, I don't know. I, I, food was the least thing through my life. Was the what? Food was not always important to me. Right. And doing art was, or mm -hmm. taking care of children. Mm -hmm. Babysitting was more important. Mm -hmm. And being in the, the woods, those things were important to me. So when I would see, you know, go to the art school and I'd see all these still lives, I'd go, Oh, how am I going to get through this? <laughs> so, um, but the way you're telling it makes me a little more interested. Oh, well, good. I'm glad to hear that. I think now you'll pay attention and look, if, look around, and when you see food art so prevalent, maybe you have a, a better awareness of it. Thank you. Thank you. That was a good, good statement. Anybody else?
uh, with children, it's um, you can use fruit or vegetables to make prints. You know, it's mm -hmm. very easy for mm -hmm. them just to stick it in a paint. You know, if you cut it in half, right. there's a lot of patterns like a star inside of an apple or the different uh, segmented places in lemons or oranges or pomegranate. Or, but it's, it's good art for very simple. They don't even have to draw it, just stamp. Yes, put the, put good. Good observation. Stamps from fruit. I like that. I hope they'll eat the fruit first before they make the stamps. I've never heard of that before. It was good. For preschoolers. Yeah. Oh, for preschoolers. All right. For, for old schoolers like us, too. Old schoolers made me think of things we used to do. I used to do with my kids when they were little. We'd make figures out of fruit, you know, stick yes. arms in them and raisins and all that for the eyes and do fruit deck make fruit creatures. So you didn't know that you were artists? No, I didn't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Never thought of that way. <laughs> and again, it's something that kids can relate to very easily. It's not scary for them. Any more conversations? I know, it looks nice. What does? Oh, oh! I'm glad you. I'm glad you like it. I, I, I thought I liked the, the light, the lighting as as an added touch. It's very, very, very neat. It's not hot. We do on Thanksgiving. I always do the relish and plates. Right. Right. I always do it in some sort of art. Every time I do it different. Why don't you talk into the mic? Um, I can try. That's okay. Is it work? Is it working? Yeah. I always do the fruit or vegetable platter for our Thanksgiving. So mm -hmm. I always do some sort of artful decoration with all the vegetables and stuff. But and it's with everything else, and it always looks good. But if I were having a dinner or something alone, I mean, at home without a whole bunch of, bunch uh -huh. of people, um, I think. Adding the scarf and turning it into a decorative piece like that, I think that's really nice. No, oh, good. You could also, right. You or you it, could, it could be on the counter, you know, it could be on the sure, counter. Sure, it could be anywhere. Could be anywhere. I think it's very cheery, especially in the middle of winter if it snows this week. It might be ha nice to have something cheerful out there. I, I'm especially fond of the pomegranate. And, um, you know what happens when you open it up? There are bazillion seeds in there. This will occupy a family for a long time, <laughs> eating a pomegranate. And, and you know what? It'll keep them quiet <laughs> if you'd like to get a little quiet. Maybe get them away from football. I have no idea when football became part of holidays. I, I don't know how that happened exactly. But I rather think I like food art as a theme. Yeah, Thanksgiving is a big event. And I think Giambaldo's work um, is probably very reminiscent of Thanksgiving with all of the harvest things. Yes, that looks like a Thanksgiving design. If you could use, you know, the things from the harvest. What goes with that is uh, uh, Judaism with uh, uh, building the sukkah and it's the, the fall harvest. So it might be nice to have an arrangement like that in addition to just having the sukkah outside, all the vegetables are out there, but on the table is nice, bring it indoors. What I thought we might do to kind of wrap up is taking a little bit of a 360 degree turn since Alan told me how innovative, what did you say I was? Innovative? You didn't say innovative, improvisational, that was the word. Well, you know, I, I go back to that because for that experience in Chicago, where I took students, uh, they gave such validity to the way of creating that you don't think a whole lot ahead of time about. And it's where a lot of Saturday Night Live comedians were born. If they could get out and just create the way I experienced you creating from that Beautiful loft gallery, and let's see. Not only all right, I'll talk. Story, but look at these two here. I'll talk a little bit about the art of creativity, or of creativity itself. Where does it come from? It comes from thinking about things in different ways, and one of the ways of thinking creative is thinking about opposites. 
So we have fruit and medicine. They're pretty opposite. And what happens in the tension between them is you get a work of art. And what I did is another way of being improvisational. I tore out the paper and put it on there. And then I said, what does that look like? Am I out of range for you? OK. And I, I put that little gray piece down. And then I said, what does it look like? So I added more gray pieces like that and more gray pieces. And I said, it looks like wild things. You know, and I realized that inside my very conservative appearance is a wild thing. Cherry knows me better. She knows there's a wild thing there. And I started building on that theme and building on it and adding to it. Uh, so I have some pastel paper here. And then I used bags from fruit. Come back to fruit again. So again, there's an opposite here. Instead of the fruit, I have what's left over from the fruit, which is those cute little bags that you never know what to do with. But they make wonderful things for collage. And I use them in two different ways. One way is like this, when it's glued on and then painted over. The other way is I lay it down, spray paint it quickly, then lift it up. And then what I have is a really, really interesting texture for use with other things. And nobody knows how I did it. And I, I kind of felt that this needed some string or yarn. If you walk around the studio up here, you know, the um, weaving studio, they have a lot of leftover, uh, leftover yarn. So I started using this in some of the things that I'm doing. And then a friend of mine, just a wonderful story about the glass. A friend of mine had a glass studio. He made, um, you know, the lamps and pictures with leaded glass. And he said, I've given up this hobby. I have tons of glass. Would you like to take it? I said, OK. Well, we, I went down to his basement. He literally meant tons. So I have lots of glass. And I started breaking it up and thought, this is really, really interesting. So I used a little bit of glass in here, some of the orange and the red. And on that one, I got really crazy. I got very bold and decided to use it almost like letters or like a ship, and slashes of the color. So it came out very, very differently. And I suppose that's improvisational, isn't it? Oh, yes. Nothing to do with food. The ocean? Oh, the ocean. Oh, ocean. Yeah, yeah, the wild ocean. This is another wild thing. And I started this one with acrylic paint in the back. Just went over the board. And then I started, very similar to what I did with that one, some cut paper. And this one, what did I use here? I don't even remember what this was. What does that look like? Oh, it was some fabric. I just tore it apart and shattered it, you know, tore it apart into little pieces and sprayed it and then finished it with the glass. You could use lint from the dryer. Yeah, you could. You really could. I, when we take a look at the pieces outside, I've used um, seeds from the garden and plant material. I have uh, some of the abstracts I did based uh, abstracts based on African masks, and I was thinking, what were the materials that they used to create their masks? And it struck me that they probably used materials that were in their environment like grasses and seeds. And that's how I did some of the abstracts out there. And what about the piece that was uh, accepted or pieces that Oh, made? OK. She has a great way of asking me questions. The five pieces on chaos really emerged from, again, what's going on in the world today. Um, one is called Tornado. It's very circular. And it looks like the wind has just kind of torn apart all the houses behind it. And another one is crack, not crack cocaine, but like the crack of a gun. In one section, there's an explosion over North Vietnam. 
and there's another one that has balanced between um, deluge, between flood and drought. Again, they're opposites that I integrated into the same piece. So the drought and the flood kind of go across from both sides. And you can see people inundated with water. And I have some of the danger signs there. And uh, down below, you see the, a desert look where people are walking on broken up clay. So those are the concepts of the five pieces. And I did something even further that's innovative. You know how when you hang art, you usually hang it either horizontal or vertical? Well, because this series is called Chaos, I have the one that's explosion hanging on an angle. It's about a 30 degree angle. And I put the wires on the back so even a dummy would get it right when they hang it. Either that or they'd want to take it apart. But I said, this is the right way to hang it, hang it on an angle. And another one I have suspended away from the wall. So, you know, you usually put the wire one third of the way down. I put the wire about half of the way down. So the top part of it looks like it's falling off the wall. So the innovation is both in the design of the pieces as well as in the way they are presented. And this will be at the Columbus Museum of Art On when? March 3rd. March 3rd. Yeah, and it only costs $100 to get in. This is a fundraiser for the Columbus Museum of Art. So that's a little bit of a plug for it. Is it really $100? It really is $100. It's a fundraiser. Yes. And I got one free ticket because I donated my art. So I will have no financial benefit from the art that's there. Just the pleasure of seeing it. Thank you. Well, it's an auction, so maybe somebody will get it in auction. That would be nice. I'm not going to buy it back. No, there's no way I'm not going to take it back. So I think I'm about ready to wrap up in here, unless you have some further comments or questions. Yes. I was just going to say, I came here on the bus, and at Broad and High, there's like a, a running news uh, uh -huh. thing in the corner. And I was just shocked. There, it said, uh, crushed skulls and pools of blood, uh, massacre of Rohingya in Myanmar. Yeah. And then I looked at that, and I was like, I, I was shocked by those words. And oh. It was just like, oh, there's like an echo, because... It was the evidence of a massacre, and that, that's like hair hanging and... Oh, well, that definitely is not what I had in mind. Topical, yeah, had I could relay, re, re, uh, retitle it, Massacre. No, I won't do that. Who was the artist who did the... Um, uh, the Guernica? The Guernica, yeah. Picasso. Picasso, yeah. This is not a Guernica by Picasso, no. I find it amazing that different people will see the same piece totally opposite. Yes. Because I had a, a large painting long time ago, and it kind of like had shapes, and um, the colors were opposite of what I had studied. I was uh -huh. studying something, and I got it from something real. And one of my friends came in and saw it, and she said, oh, that's hell. You know, because yeah. it, was, it was bright yellow, you know, yellow and oranges, and uh -huh. for her, it was hell. And another friend came in, and she said, oh, that's water. She was a fisherman, and it was. It was water. It was water. Yeah. yeah. Isn't it interesting the way people see what they think they see, mm -hmm. and they interpret it? There's something about the human eye, for those of you who work on abstracts, there's something about the human eye that will try to make something real out of something that's impressionistic or uh, uh, unreal, not made to be real. Cherry's work is like that. You can look at it and you'll see different things in what she does. And it's your eye interpreting. Here's my interpretation or my idea about why we do that. In order to survive, we would look at people's faces to determine if this was an enemy or a friend. So we had a way of looking to see if this is safe or this is dangerous. And I think part of that ability, it's in our brains, not necessarily in our eyes, but in our brains, 
we look to interpret what is it that we're seeing and we have a tendency to turn it into something that we've, that's familiar to us. I didn't think wild oceans when I did this. I didn't necessarily think wild things when I started it. But after a while, as I started finishing it, then the ideas came together. Now, going back to our fruits, which are largely invisible at the moment, we, when you look at a fruit setup, you know what it is, right? That's another reason why still lifes are very nice. People know what they're looking at. It looks safe to them. Other than the artists who turn things into blood and guts. You know, there, there is a still life, a very famous still life, actually several of them, with, um, with animals and fish that have been gutted. You know, they're hanging up. I didn't show that because it didn't appeal to me. But there certainly is a genre of art like that and still life work. Uh, but we, we look at things and we put it together in our mind's eye, something familiar, something that we know about. And we can certainly make food, something familiar and warm and comfortable and happy. It takes us to a pleasant place and a happy place. Inga wanted to say something in response to what you were saying. Yeah, Sorry. well, <clears throat> I was a high school English teacher and it occurred to me over and over again when I was teaching literature that the ability of a student to comprehend a piece of literature depended entirely on his or her life experience mm -hmm. and what, how they could see the same piece of literature and see totally different things in it because of what was in their background or what wasn't in, in their background. And I think the absolute same thing is true with art. You look at a piece of, if I'd never seen fruit before, I would have no appreciation, perhaps, for what you just mm -hmm. did there. And I'd say, what's all that stuff? What are those round things? You know, and if a kid had never seen fruit before, would you all of the things you said today would sort of right. go over the top. But the Rohingya refugees might be. Yeah, but because we know what fruit is, we started from a place where we already understood right. some of it, and then you took off from there. Right. But if we had no basic understanding of the art, we'd just look at it which I think happens to me a lot with really modern art, you know. <laughs> I just keep looking at it, looking for something that I can hold on to, and that doesn't always happen. Well, with the modern art, in the last, pe the last piece that I had up there, remember she said about her art, don't look at the colors, look at the lines. So it is not necessarily an exact replica of what it is. But just by saying that, she leads the viewer by the hand to look at what, what she's presenting. Now, I have a question that I, I, maybe I can leave you with. Where is art going in the future? I see a lot of installation art. I see a lot of really art with political statements. I'm really curious to see where it's going to go next. Are we going to still have realistic looking art? Are we going to continue to have abstract? Cubism, Impressionism, where's it going to go from there? What's the next 20, 30, 40 years going to see? Will we still be doing still lifes? I'll be eating fruit. I don't know about you, but I will continue to eat fruit. And where's the piece of orange? Did they all get consumed? Oh, well, I passed them up. Come on. I'm, You're ready for some now? Yeah, I'm ready for some now. Well, thank you all for coming. It's been a delight, and we had a lot of conversation. Thank you.